Mike, and we're in chapter 3. You probably think we'll never get out of chapter 3, but you know what? We're not trying to get through the Bible. We're trying to get the Bible in us, and that's the deal. That's the deal. The title of my message today is Keeping Your Body, the Conspiracy Against Health. A common theme, but I tell you what, uh, if we're going to break through the propaganda, the devil's trying to kill you. The devil is trying to kill you. And the uh, most important thing is to have eternal life, to believe on the Lord Jesus, our Savior. And, uh, but nevertheless, just like you've got to get a drunk off of his alcohol to get his mind clear, uh, I tell you, God wants, to, want, wants you to be healthy, wants you to have energy and strength, but the devil comes to kill. Keeping your body the conspiracy against health. Dear Holy Father, we do pray you will bless the preaching of thy word. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for this Bible. Thank you for this church. Now please give me good ground to preach upon. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. If you'll turn it down just a touch. We're in chapter 3, verse 3. A time to kill and a time to heal. And now our text for today, verse 6. A time to keep and a time to cast away. We've been looking, Church of God, at the many things you're called to keep in the Bible. And uh, we've only dealt with wisdom, keeping wisdom. But God willing, in the future, we'll explore some more of these things the Bible says to keep. But along with wisdom, foundationally, we need to keep ourselves. Children, you need to keep yourselves. And it's always time to keep yourself. Now, if God wants you to give up your life for Him, that's different. But you need to keep yourself from sin. You boys in the back, you need to keep yourselves from foolishness, bad influences. And it says in these last days, temptation will abound. So you've got to keep yourselves in wisdom, keep yourselves in holiness, keep yourselves in purity. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. It means don't put somebody in an office in church that you barely know. Or, or don't send somebody out as a pastor uh, when you're not sure of their character and that type of thing. You don't want to participate in helping somebody else sin. You don't want to enable somebody else. But notice it says keep thyself pure. Look at James 1, pure religion. Part of it is to keep himself unspotted from the world. Keep himself, keep himself, keep thyself pure, keep yourself unspotted. God doesn't want one spot on you. You are, to, you are to hate the garments spotted by the flesh. Look at 1 John 5. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one toucheth him not. That's in regard to temptation. Meaning uh, bringing you under Satan's dominion. And I believe what God's saying here. If you don't keep yourself, Satan's going to find an easy target. Hey, pay attention, little one. He's going to find an easy target. It's going to be easy to lead you astray. Keep yourself. The wicked one touches you not. That doesn't mean he's not going to try. It means he's not going to get control over you. Predators go after the vulnerable among the herd. Those that are limping, they prey upon an easy target, or they would prefer to. Notice 2 Timothy 3, for of this sort, talking about the last days, are they which creep into houses. You think about that today now. There's going to be some creeps creeping into houses. And lead captive wise women. No, no, creeps are going to go after the vulnerable. 
They can smell flesh. They, 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 there's something about creeps when they, they'll come out of the woodwork. Somebody will walk around, they look like a normal person until somebody gets, gets vulnerable. And they can, they can detect weakness. And then you will see the fangs and, and, and they will come out and they go after somebody that's vulnerable. So when you show that vulnerability, talking about uh, sinful vulnerability, when you show foolishness, uh, oh, the creeps are going to try to use you. So notice it says they lead captive. That's what we've been talking about. Lead captive. Silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. So where do they lead them away to? Out of their house. Out of their role as a godly woman. Out of their marriage. Uh, into false doctrine. So don't miss this now. He that is, that is begotten of God, meaning he that is walking in God's spirit, keepeth himself. And the wicked one touches you not. See, you're too strong for him to mess with. You're protected by walking in the spirit. But if you want to be foolish, if you want to be silly... You're going to be led captive. You're going to be taken advantage. The devil's already got you because you're foolish in one sense, but there is a way in which he keeps you foolish and holds you captive. So what we're telling you is you need to keep yourself. Keep yourself from being silly. We, we preached last week on keeping yourself in God's wisdom. We know by analogy that a weak body, a weak immune system, more easily falls prey to disease or the pestilence that walketh in darkness. You get an elderly person who's weak, they haven't been on a good diet, they haven't been eating nutritionally uh, because of age and infirmity and maybe a bad diet also, they get a little cold or a little sniffle or something. They go to the hospital where there's all kinds of pestilence walking in darkness. Every disease you can imagine. It's in the curtains. It's in the air. It, it's all in that place. And uh, they walk and the next thing you know, they got pneumonia and they're dead. It's the pestilence that walketh in darkness, but it's the, the pathogens are preying upon weakness. You see, they get a foothold in weakness. What is true physically is true spiritually. The devils that walk in darkness, the spirit of the air, they are looking for weakness. They are looking for an opening. They're looking for a cut or something where they can gain entrance and pollute the whole body spiritually. Now, we know that true holiness is associated with wholeness with a W. Be still, little one. Holiness is wholeness. In other words, holiness involves the whole person kept from sin. You are not holy unless your whole person is kept from sin. That's every part of you. That's your mind. That's your soul. That's your body. We look for a glorified body when there will be no sin. There will be temptations. But if you walk after those temptations, that's sin. Notice 2 Corinthians 7 now. Think about this now. True holiness is associated with the whole person. If you're going to keep yourself, you've got to keep your whole person. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to... Uh, Concentrate on my inward man. No, you got to concentrate upon your whole person. 2 Corinthians 7, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, that's your body, and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I want you to see something right now. All filthiness. Holiness involves cleansing yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. That's outside, that's inside. Holiness is with, a, with an H, but it's, you could look at it as wholeness. 
not in a new age sense, but in keeping your outward body and your inward person clean. 1 Thessalonians 5, and the very God of peace sanctify you. There's our W word, holy. And I pray God your, here's our W word again. I praise God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. That's another way of keeping. Be kept blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It better be. It better be. You better keep your inside and your outside holy. The Bible speaks of God keeping his words from the wicked generation, and then it says he preserves them from this wicked generation. To keep is to preserve. To preserve is to keep. So you need to keep your body, keep your spirit holy, cleansed from filthiness. Now let's talk about how you begin this process. First of all, you've got to be born again through faith, of course. You've got to be a new creature. You've got to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That is the most important thing. But then the Lord gives you a kingdom to seek after, and He wants you to walk in the Spirit and race for the prize. There is a cleaning of the inside of the cup first. So the outside may be clean also. But I want you to think about this for a second, brother. Jesus says that the outside may be clean also. Also. The Lord wants the inside of the club cup clean, but he wants the outside of the cup cleaned also. Don't you ever fall into that doctrine that holiness, spirituality, whatever you want to call it, is only concerned with the inward man. Now, you can make a mistake like the Pharisees and think that holiness only involved the outward man. But there's also the opposite. In fact, if you're not clean outwardly, how are you, how are you really clean on the inside since the outward is a manifestation of what's going on on the inside? So there's this wicked perversion of Christ's words today that says as long as I think I'm clean on the inside, I don't have to worry about the outside of the cup. It has invaded almost every denomination in Christianity today. I know the scriptures teach that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. Proverbs 4 sums up this primacy of the heart. Proverbs 4 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So we need to stress the inside, because the outside is a manifestation of the inside. But hold on a second. Here's where we can go wrong. Look at the very next verses which specify how you keep your heart. Look at verse 24. Put away from thee a forward mouth. Uh-oh. And perverse lips put far from thee. That's your lips and anybody else's. So I believe in verse 24 we're saying if you're going to keep your heart, you've got to keep your ears. You've got to keep your mouth. So when Solomon, through the Holy Ghost, tells you to keep your heart, he tells you you've got to keep your body. You've got to keep your ears. You've got to keep your lips. Not only that, verse 25, let thy eyes look right on and let thy eyelids look straight before thee and ponder the path of thy feet. Let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. What did the Holy Ghost do? The Holy Ghost says keep your heart with all diligence and then he begins to tell you you better keep your body. Now, what's going on here? Why are you immediately told to watch and guard your physical body to keep your heart? One reason is because these are the gates and pathways to your heart. The ears, the lips, the eyes, the feet, the hands. So what this teaches is that there is a way in which 
If you are not keeping your body, you are not keeping your heart. Say it another way. Uh, you, you could read Bunyan and Holy War. If you're not keeping eye gate and ear gate, and, and if you're not keeping these doorways to your heart, you're going to get corrupted. The ancient Gnosticism has revived today for this wicked generation. They pretended to stress the inside while neglecting the body or teaching that it didn't matter what we do in our bodies. You could call it hippie Christianity if you want. Today you'll hear people rest the words of the Bible that speak of our sinful flesh. They'll use verses to excuse sin in the body. The Bible says we're wretched. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Uh, and they'll begin to pinch their body and say, this is just flesh. It's just dust. I don't have to worry about this. It's all sinful. Somebody's trying to excuse some sins in the body, aren't they? Yeah, somebody's trying to excuse some sin. Somebody don't want to clean the outward. And you know what? It's a good sign. If they're not wanting to clean the outside of the cup, Something's wrong about the inside of the cup, too. They can talk about how spiritual they are all they want, but if you don't want to clean the outside of the cup, something's wrong with the inside. The Bible said in the last days they will rest Paul's words and other scriptures. An example like this is in 1 Samuel 16, The Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. People love to take scriptures like this in an absolute sense to imply that God looks on the heart means he never looks on the body. That's not what the scripture's saying. The scripture's not saying that you can do whatever you want outwardly. The outside of the cup you can just get as filthy and worldly as you want, but just the inside of the cup is all God sees. That's not what it's saying. It's saying God is so much more powerful than man that he can see the heart and he stresses the heart and he doesn't care how tall you are, how beautiful you are, how handsome you are. What God cares about most is your character. That's what 1 Peter says, that meek and quiet spirit, if you're obedient to your husband, is more important than whether your hair's braided. Though the Bible wants you to be outwardly beautiful in one sense, it says adorn yourself with modest apparel. Just make sure you do it in the right way. God's not against outward beauty. He's against you making beauty the end of everything, making outward appearance everything. So this is saying God is able to look beyond just outward appearance and weigh a man's character. But what people do today is they say, God just looks on the heart. Oh, how many times I've heard that. Oh, how many times people said, you know, I can have long hair as a man because God just looks on the heart. I can cut my hair off like a man as a woman and because uh, God just looks on the heart. I can desecrate my body and trash my body like an ancient Philistine and that doesn't matter because God looks upon the heart. I can wear men's clothes or women's clothes, the opposite sex, because God just looks on the heart. I can be immodest and dress like a harlot, as the Bible says, the attire of a harlot, because God just looks on the heart. This doesn't mean God doesn't have any rules for your body. This doesn't mean that how a person dresses is absolutely insignificant. This doesn't mean that what you do in your body is totally insignificant. As we saw from Proverbs chapter 4, a foundational part of keeping your heart is by keeping your body, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your feet, your hands. Listen to the principle that the Lord taught to Nicodemus. Look at John chapter 3. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Think about this for a second now. And let's try to hurry up and be still and sit down. The Bible says, if you don't believe earthly things, 
How can you believe spiritual things? John used this argument later. If you can't deal with what you can see, what makes you think you can deal with God who you can't see? Paraphrasing. If you can't get things right in the physical, what makes, what makes you think you're going to get things right in the spiritual? Notice how Paul puts an emphasis on keeping the body as foundational, as foundational. I'm not telling you just clean up the outside of the cup. I'm telling you that you need the inside and outside. And we often think of cleaning the inside as foundational for the outside, and it certainly is. But there is a way. There is an application where cleaning the outside is foundational to the inside. And before I'm taken out of context, there's a drunk and you getting sobered. You can witness to him better. Believe me, I've given the Bible to a lot of drunks in my lifetime and... Uh, not easy to speak to a drunk person about spiritual things. Something has to be done. They have to get in a sober state. That's just one example. Notice this foundational verse, 1 Corinthians 9. But I keep under my body, says Paul, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. The Bible said there's a time to keep and a time to cast away, and it's true with God also. He doesn't want to be one of these that are cast away at the judgment seat of Christ. So, but what Paul's saying is, I keep under my body. What does he mean by that? He means he keeps his body under him. What does it mean to keep your body under you? It means he keeps his body down. What does it mean to keep your body down? It means I keep my body under subjection. What does it mean to keep your body under subjection? It means I rule my body. So when Paul says I keep under my body, he means I keep myself in such a state that I am in charge of my body. My body is not in charge of me. And it's in the context of fighting, in the context of athletic striving. Paul says, I do not let my body rule me, lest I be cast away. It seems then what Paul is saying is the ruling of our bodies is very foundational to our holiness and whether or not we will be cast away at the judgment seat of Christ. Why is that? Do you know that ruling your body goes far in keeping your soul an inward man? Let me prove it to you. Look at Psalms 35. David says, I humbled my soul with fasting. Now, wait a second. Stop for a second. I humbled my soul with fasting. How did the soul, which is not material, get humbled by the material? How did the spiritual realm get humbled by the physical realm? There is some type of... Uh, Unity between our bodies and our souls and our spirits. And by getting control of his physical body, David says, I actually humbled the lusts of my soul. Look at 1 Peter 4. He that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. He doesn't mean this in a monkish or ascetic way. It's been taken too far. He doesn't mean go sit on a rock and contort your body and sit there for hours and hours and hours. But you know what? We can go to the other extreme. We can say, oh, I'm not a monk. I'm not a Catholic. So there is nothing I have to do to my body, you know. 
There's no discipline. There's no fasting. There's no denial that I ever have to do to my body. <clears throat> it sounds like to me some good old-fashioned self-denial that's been taken out of a lot of the new versions. Fasting's been taken out of the new versions in many ways. It's certainly been taken out of our modern Christian culture. So many American Christians have become Gnostics in another extreme. God forbid I deny my body. I heard Luther, before he got saved, when he was a monk, he slept on a bed of nails, you know. Well, can't you go to the other extreme? Must we be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease? There can be a pampering of the body, a catering to the body, where the body becomes like a spoiled child. And a spoiled child usually goes to hell. You think you're loving your child, you're sending it to hell. Let me tell you again. You think you're loving your child by pampering and spoiling and not training and not disciplining, but you are sending your child to hell. When your child is grown, the Bible says your child will go to hell. Can God interrupt that somehow with His grace and mercy? Yeah, but God says it's the normal way that you spoil a child. It's going to go to hell. You spoil your body. You can't ever tell your body no. You give your body whatever it wants. Then who rules? Your body rules. And if you can't deny your body anything... What other lusts can you deny? If you can't deny something unhealthy to your body that your brain and your mind know are, is wrong and hurtful, why? What makes you think that you can deny anything else that your lust wants? David says, I humbled my soul by fasting. There are sins of the mind, but a large part of sin must manifest itself by means of your body. Your body is an instrument. That's why it says in Romans 6, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members, that's your body parts, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Sin wants to get control of your body. If you can't control your body, then your body will be controlled by sin. You are either mastering your body or your body is in control of uh, your body is being controlled by sin. It says in Romans 8, if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So I stress again that part of keeping your heart is through keeping the body from sin. And to keep your body from sin, you have to learn to rule your body. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, I will not be brought under the power of any of anything. I will not be brought under the power, talking about food and drink, I will not be brought under the power. Because to be brought under the power of food and drink means I am brought under the power of the desires of my body. You children, I want you all to get here in church and get your water before, before preaching. Now the Bible says that he will not be brought under the power of anything. And when you are brought under the power of food and drink, you're being brought under the power of your body. Look at some more verses. Look at Proverbs 21, 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Whoever keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his souls from troubles. Keepeth his soul. How do I keep my soul from troubles? By watching over my tongue. There's a symbiotic relationship going on here between the physical and the spiritual. 
And don't you forget it. Because if you forget it, you will end up like one of these modern Christians that have totally divorced anything outward as having any degree, or they might say don't be a homosexual or something, but for the most part, anything in your body goes. Anything outward has nothing to do with Christianity. That's what they're teaching today. It's Gnosticism. I don't care what you call it. It's wrong. Now listen to me. If the soul can be humbled by fasting, think with me today now. Think with me. Think with me, young people. If the soul can be humbled by fasting, denying the body, then the reverse is also true. By not denying the body, the soul or heart can be made sinful. If you can humble your soul by fasting, then by an inordinate, unwise gluttony, I can hurt my soul. I can make my soul proud. And you know when the Lord talked about the last days? He ended his sermon with this conclusion. Talking about earthquakes, pestilence, wars, people betraying one another, family members betraying one another, all of these perilous things, signs in the heavens, all of these things, raging waves of the sea, all of these things. And then he concludes it by saying, Luke 21, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts, your hearts, okay, inside, modern Christians like that, your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life so that day come upon you unawares. Wait just a minute. The Lord says in the last days you got to really watch your heart so make sure you got this food thing straight. The Lord said in the last days you better make sure we have this food thing straight. Why? The Lord says, oh, surfeiting and drunkenness, this intemperate living, this unhealthy living for the flesh, you know. It overcharges your heart. What's it mean to have your, your, your heart overcharged? I bet you it means the opposite of having your soul humbled. If David humbled his soul with fasting, then there's obviously an overcharging of the soul or heart that can be brought to pass by intemperate living. God wants us to enjoy the things that he gives us. And one of Solomon's points in Ecclesiastes is God gives us good things. Enjoy the food that he's given you. But, but he always says do it in the fear of God. Don't lose the fear of God when you enjoy the things of this world. I'm not talking about sinful world. I mean physical things. The Bible said in the last days in the book of Jude that they'll be among you and feed themselves without fear. They will have no fear what they say about authorities. And they will have no fear what they stick in their mouth or how much they stick in their mouth. That's a sign of the last days, feeding themselves without fear, without fear, without fear. If you're intemperate in regard to earthly things, how can you expect to be temperate in regard to spiritual things? And this is something that modern Christianity has largely lost. You go back and read all of the great evangelists of the past and these early Christians and, and you see a temperance in regard to earthly things, in regard to outward things. So where is modern Christianity at or where is it going, so-called Christianity? They believe they can cut themselves like an ancient Philistine and tattoo themselves all over their body, and the only reason the devil wants you to tattoo yourself is to trash your body. See, people have cars. They say, don't you mark on my car. Don't you put graffiti on my wall. Don't you come and put graffiti on the side of my garage door. Don't you trash my house. So the devil says, trash your body. Show how cool and wild you are by trashing your body as a symbol to everybody 
that morally you trash your body. See? If you already got a tattoo, get rid of it. Cover it up. Don't flaunt it. Walk around in shame. Say, I did this when I was stupid. Holiness is absolutely and only inward in this modern view of Christianity. They don't understand 1 Thessalonians 5 about your whole body being preserved. Your whole body, soul, and spirit being preserved or kept blameless. They don't understand Paul's words to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. <clears throat> Many think that doing your best to maintain physical health or strength in your body is unrelated to holiness. They don't consider Ecclesiastes 3 that says there's a time to kill and a time to heal. If you're in a situation where you have to bow down to an image or be thrown into the fire, then you're going to choose going into the fire, hopefully. Listen to me. But does that mean I have a right to just go jump into fire? Hey, listen to me. To obey God, you might have to be thrown in a dungeon where they're going to barely give you anything to eat. And you have to take that choice if you're to be an obedient Christian. But does that mean that I just go ahead and just let myself be trashed physically? No, there's a time to kill. But doing yourself harm is wrong. It's irresponsible. In Acts 16, Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm! What he told the jailer is, don't kill yourself with that sword. So is it okay if I pick up something else? Say, well, it's not a sword, Paul, but how about if I poison myself? Is that all right? Paul would say, no, don't do yourself any harm. Don't do yourself any harm. Ecclesiastes 7 says, Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Now this is what people say. This is what the good old boys say. The good old boys say, well, we're just going to go whenever it's God's time and everything will kill you, so, you know, we're just going to go whenever it's time. Oh, Lester Roloff, he tried to, and I've heard him. I've been to churches where they said this. Lester Roloff, look at him. Look, look what it got him. He died in a plane crash. And then the whole church, hundreds and hundreds of people laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. What did health food give old Roloff? When you got to go, you got to go. The point is, if God takes me, no matter what it's through, I want it to be a body that I have not abused. If God ever calls me to lay down this body and sacrifice for Him, I want it to be a body that I have not abused. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Ecclesiastes 10, Blessed art thou, O Lamb, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. And I will say by application and point here, Blessed are you when the leader of your home eats for strength. Blessed are you when your pastor eats for strength. Blessed are you when all leaders, when your mama, blessed are you when all leaders eat for strength. When they put what's healthy and wise and makes them strong over what tastes good to the flesh. Praise God, he made food tasty. So you don't need MSG and all this fake stuff to make food taste good. So you probably do today the way they grow it. Let's try to be still, boys. So we should not be harming ourselves in self-indulgence. We should not be eating for taste with no consideration of the consequences or strength to the body. 
Now, why should you be strong in your body to serve God? If you're not to yield your body, your members, as instruments to unrighteousness, the point is that you, you don't just go throw your body away. The point is to yield your instruments as instruments of righteousness to have the strength to do good things. If God providentially puts you in a sick bed, then pray and try to keep serving God in whatever capacity you can. But don't put yourself on a sick bed. Don't let the devil put you on a sick bed. Don't let the devil hinder you. If God providentially hinders you, then offer to God whatever you have left. But don't put yourself there due to sin or foolishness or lust or addiction or laziness. God says in Jeremiah 47, How long will thou cut thyself? That's what pagans do. How long will you cut thyself? I think God would be saying to modern American Christians today, How long will you poison yourself? I don't care if you jump into fire. I don't care if you try to drown yourself. I don't care if you try to cut yourself. I don't care if you try to poison yourself. It's wrong to hurt yourself. Do thyself no harm. How long will you poison yourself? 1 Kings 18, they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. That's what pagans do. That's what the Philistines do. How long will you cut yourself, you worshipers of Baal? God forbid when he has to say to the people of God, how long will you poison yourselves? Now, a lot of folks won't be able to make it to this point in my sermon. But I had a lot of very important information. And if they would have just held on through some of that preaching, I want to prove to you who it is that's trying to tempt you to poison yourself. Who is it that wants people to hurt or weaken themselves? Let's look at John 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. There it is. He, he doesn't come but to do these things. I come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Okay. You got two different powers. Personalities. Persons. One is the Lord Jesus Christ. The other is the devil. I believe in them both. Meaning I believe that they exist. I believe in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I believe there is a personal devil. It's not just the spirit of evil, the idea of evil. There is a real devil who is a real being. And what does he do? He and every other thief who follows him comes to destroy, to kill, and to steal. In contrast to the Lord and all of his servants who come that you might have life and have abundant life. Not just have life, but have abundant life eternally as well as physically. Our Lord didn't come and say, all I'm concerned about is eternal life. All I'm concerned about... No, he fed people, and he fed them good food. He not only fed them, he healed the blind. He healed their physical infirmities. The Lord cares about physical life. So it's the devil, first and foremost, who wants you to poison yourself. The devil has angels. They want you to poison yourself. Let me prove it to you. Mark chapter 9. And oftentimes it, what it, it the evil spirit hath cast him, who's the him, the boy or the child, into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. What does the thief come to do? To destroy. So it cast the child into fire or into water. The devil did not care. This evil spirit did not care whether the child was thrown into fire or whether he was thrown into water as long as it destroyed his body. That's what that, little, that's what that wicked devil wanted to do to that child. It didn't care whether it used fire or whether it used water as long as he hurt himself. Mark 5, another devil-possessed man. Always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting, cutting himself with stones. The same spirits that move people to be naked are the same spirits that move people to harm themselves. Some more blatantly, others more subtly or indirectly or incrementally. He'll do whatever he can get away with. 
If he's got enough control over you that you'll just jump into the fire and burn yourself, oh, he's real happy. But if he only has enough control that you'll slowly burn yourself, slowly mess with it, slow, if you'll just pick up poison that'll kill you instantly, he's happy with that. But if you'll say, no, no, just like I'm just going to slowly burn myself, I'm going to slowly poison myself and burn my insides, it's still fire, chemical burn, what's the difference? Now, it's right here that some people will become very unreasonable. They would say, why would Satan send devils to tempt me to eat junk food or harmful chemicals? I believe that's an unreasonable question. I believe that's an unreasonable question. The devils don't care how you are destroyed physically as long as you are destroyed physically. The Bible speaks of death in the pot. The Bible speaks of death by drowning, death by burning. The Bible speaks of death in the pot, death by poison. Satan don't care what form of death you use. The book of James speaks of death by poison, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. If the devils can gain control, they will, to whatever degree they have control over you, cause you to hurt yourself. A sign of demonic influence is the desire to be naked, a desire to show up in public naked, as well as a desire to hurt yourself to not care about yourself, to neglect your body for no godly reason whatsoever. I don't know why anybody would doubt this when the Lord, when speaking about the last days, concluded his sermon with a warning about overcharging the heart with surfeiting. It seems Satan can use food to not only weaken and destroy the body, But he has even greater intentions than that. He uses food as a pathway to weaken the inward man as well. The devil says, I'm not just weakening the body here. I'm going to get him to sin before I kill him, see. Because they don't have any self-control over the outward, they're not going to have self-control over the inward either. And I'm just setting them up for the great sin. And, and, And they're going to do the great sin for me before I send them into hell, before I kill their body totally. Why would anybody deny that? This whole thing started by a woman in paradise with so much good food around her, but she wanted the one poisonous food that God said don't eat. There's only one thing that was poisonous in that whole garden. And the devil showed up to that woman and said, eat the poisonous thing. Eat the poisonous thing. Be still. The same serpent tempts people today to be intemperate and unwise. I don't believe in mythology. I don't believe that's just a myth. I believe Eve stuck something in her mouth that was poisonous. Sure, by doing it, she was declaring herself to be God, but she had no right to harm herself. God says, the day you do that, you'll die. Don't you do that. There was no physical death. There was no spiritual death until she did that. Now people will say, now hold on a second. I just don't think the devils in these last days would care about that. I just don't think they would care about food. Okay, even though the serpent started this whole thing with food? Even though the Lord ended his sermon about the last days with food? And you still don't think the devil has anything to do with food? What Bible do you read? I just think devils have something more important to do. Let's see if they do. 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. What? 
the Holy Ghost said, you better beware, the devils in the last days are going to seduce a bunch of believers, some believers. And he's going to seduce them in regard to food. Food. Now, why would the devil do that? Well, let me ask you a question. Why does he want people to abstain from marriage? Abstain from marriage? Why does he want people to abstain from marriage? What do all these priests, some of them not called to be single, you just do a little research about what's happening with the Catholic Church right now over in Italy and all around the world. Those priests, and, and they're even saying, we, we've got to get rid of this doctrine that keeps the priests from getting married because these priests are ending up in fornication. The nuns are ending up in fornication. You, you've got uh, abuse of children and all of these horrible things that are coming. And Paul said it's better to marry than to burn. The devils don't want you to marry because they want people to fall into fornication and sin. They want to hurt people that are called. Marriage is a, is a good thing for those that are called to it. It can be. So why would he want you to abstain from meat? Good meat. Seems to me to weaken you. To weaken you. I know that it may be beneficial for most people to go on a non-meat cleanse. Why is that? People say, you wouldn't believe. I've stayed off meat for a couple months and look at, at how healthy I am. Well, I guess so. Meat is where most of the hormones are put. That's where most of the antibiotics, these feedlot animals, that's where most of the, the stuff that hurts you is in this meat. You stay off dairy, stay off meat, and I guess you are being a lot more healthy. You probably are cleansing yourself. But I believe it's dangerous for long term. And I believe that's what the people, many vegetarians have found that out. Many vegetarians have renounced vegetarianism and have said, you know what, I found out it's not for long term living. We healed many diseases, by, but then all of a sudden you get more diseases in the long term. Gandhi from India. was very serious about his vegetarianism. But then all of a sudden he got an ailment. And then he drank goat milk and it healed him. And he kept drinking goat, goat milk for the rest of his life. The point is, you're expressly warned that devils in the last days will be involved in hurting or weakening people by diet choices. You're telling me the same devils that want you to stay away from protein so you'll be weak? You're telling me the same devils somehow or another don't want you to eat poison? You're telling me the devils that want you to get weak by not eating meat have no concern over whether or not you eat poison or not? Is not this person devil-possessed in WorldNet Daily last night with the headline, Psycho terror scare at conservative conference. Twitter thread. I love slipping my estradiol pills in the coffee. She appears, she, whatever, appears to be Lauren Walker, someone raising money for facial feminization surgery as part of a transgender procedure. It is devil possessed. Whatever it is, it, it is full of devil influence. However, Starbuck says she does not work for the coffee chain. Estradiol is a prescription drug used to increase estrogen in women experiencing menopause and is also used in the transgender treatments. Well, transgenders know that if you put hormones in your body, it can feminize males. They know it. They get prescriptions for it. Why do you, The farmers know it. They put it in their animals to make them bigger. But somehow other Christians don't know it. What I'm showing you here is this devil-possessed person or devil-influenced person claimed to try to hurt somebody by sticking estrogen pills in the coffee of a bunch of conservatives. Now, branch out from there. Are you telling me other evil people in high places who have the power to do so don't want to do the same thing in your food supply? Can we really be that ignorant to think that 
as these companies get bigger and bigger and bigger and the media gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you just have a few companies left and they're trying to get rid of all the, 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 the independent companies, you're telling me they have no agenda whatsoever to kill you and harm you? New York Times, just the other day, American adults just keep getting fatter. Public health experts said that they were alarmed by the continuing, continuing rise in obesity. And the fact that educating people about poor diet choices, the health risks, do not seem to be working. No, it's not going to work, and I'll tell you why it's not working. I'll tell you why. Nutritionists and other experts cite lifestyle, genetics, and most importantly, a poor diet as factors. U.S. fast food sales rose 22% from 2012 to 2017, while packaged food rose 8%. I'll show you why it's not working. I'll show you why you can educate people over and over and over, and it's not going to work. You know why it's not going to work? The Bible said in the last days, they will be, the Bible said in the last days, creeps will creep into houses, lead astray silly women, ever learning, and never able to come to knowledge of truth. What's the Bible saying? The Bible is saying in the last days there's going to be an information explosion. But the devil will have such control over the propaganda that even if you present facts to people over and over and over again, they will never be able to understand them. That's powerful. That's powerful. They so say, we don't understand. We're giving people information over and over. It's not working. No, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. In 1952, the grandson of Charles Darwin suggested using synthetic hormones to alter men and women. But something more important here I want to give you. Uh, I'll read this, and you know I'll read pretty quickly, so don't get alarmed. In 1984, Besmanov wrote a love letter to America. Besmanov. He was an ex- KJV propaganda, or, or, or he worked for the uh, propaganda arm of the KJV. Uh, he was a communist defector in 1970. He's considered a propaganda expert. And uh, he wrote, after defecting, after leaving, escaping, putting his life at risk, he came over uh, and wrote a love letter to America to try to tell you, listen, you need to know what we were doing to you. We need to know, you need to know what we as communists have been doing to you as Americans. So I want you to think about this now. Everything we've said about the devil, everything we've seen about the last days. Now listen, the Bible said they're going to creep into houses and lead astray silly women. Dear Americans, I am what you may call a defector. People all over the earth, whether they praise America or bitterly criticize her, look upon you as the only hope for mankind's survival and the last stronghold of freedom. I'm writing this not to please you with words you want to hear. Whether you believe it or not, you are at war. Having been trained and used by the KJB, I have some first-hand knowledge. If the liberationists succeed in bringing their new order to America, chances are you and I will meet in front of a firing squad, or worse, in a re-education forced labor camp. The art of duping the masses into doing things to their own disadvantage and making them believe it is, the, it is the will of the people is as ancient as mankind itself. 500 years before Christ, the Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu formulated the principle of subversion this way, cover with ridicule all the valid traditions in your opponent's country, implicate their leaders in criminal affairs and turn them over to the scorn of the populace at the right time, spread disunity and turn the young against the old. About 2,500 years later, we can read this very same instruction in a secret document allegedly authored by the Communist International for their young revolutionaries. Corrupt the young, make them superficial and enfeebled. Divide the people into hostile groups. Destroy people's faith in their national leaders. Cause breakdown of the old moral virtues, honesty, sobriety, self-restraint, faith in the pledged word. Now, I cannot vouch for the authenticity of this document, but I can assure you that these rules are almost a literal interpretation of those theories and practices which I learned from my KJV superiors. At long last, in 1983, in his new book, KJB Today, John Barron accurately and excellently described the process of demoralization, basing some of his analysis on the data supplied by another KJV defector. 
John Barron ominously titled one chapter of his book dedicated to the analysis of the active measures, Reality Upside Down. Excellent title. This is exactly what my KJB gurus of subversion taught me. To change the direction of America's future, you have to educate a new generation of Americans. He said, the old ones, you're not going to be able to get them to change their thinking. What he's saying is, based upon the propaganda they've been fed, they will not, no matter what facts you give them, change their thinking. If some of them do, that's by the grace of God. But what they're saying is, what we've done to these people, there is no way you can get them to change that he knows of. Your only hope is a new generation. See, But all the subverter has to do to remove the spiritual backbone of America is to help you to politicize, commercialize, and entertainmentalize the dominant religions. Spreading of various religious cults, including satanic and death cults. What he's saying is the communists are involved in commercializing and turning church into an entertainment center. Spreading out, various, and when I say communist, I don't just mean whatever communists are still in Russia. I mean those that have a communist plan for the whole world. See, They haven't gone away no matter what you think. They've just changed their names. See, And, and in some ways they're not even changing their name. I mean, we almost elected a socialist. And he was openly a so. You go to high schools, uh, you, you go to uh, colleges now and ask them, what do you think of communism or socialism? Listen to what they say. Preaching moral relativity. Church performances with a group of rock or pop musicians with a message of social justice sugar-coated in popular spiritual tunes. People hab habitually refer to the American media as free, ignoring the obvious and commonly known fact that most of the most powerful media in the USA is already monopolized, both financially and ideologically, by what are referred to as liberals. American media chains belong to fewer and fewer owners. Years ago, when I was scanning through a pile of Western newspapers, I came across a column. Quote, if I were a communist agent in America with millions of dollars to spend annually, I would lavish and encourage obscure musicians. <clears throat> I would seek out the more questionable publishers of the dirtier paperbacks. Anything that promoted the insubordination of teenagers. Anything that contributes to the confusion and exasperation of parents. You teenagers, you think about this for a second. There are people that want you to disobey your parents. There are people that have made sure that the court situation today, whatever it is, that your entertainment on TV, they want you to disobey your parents. Not so they can pat you on the head and say, good little boy and girl. No, they want to use you. They want to use you to destroy America. The basic intention of my spending would be to break down the discipline, encourage relaxation of authority of every kind, so as to build up in as short time as possible an adult generation that could easily go out of control. This was written in 1959. The accuracy of this description of our activity stunned me. Demoralization in the area of food consumption patterns is also effective in the introduction of such things as junk foods. I'll say it again. Not only according to this KJV defector are they messing up the churches in America. He says we are messing up the food supply. We are doing that to America. Why, why not? If you want to destroy a people, make them weak. No, KJV agents do not put chemicals into the American food and drink. It is done by some American mega monopolies who operate along the same principles as the Soviet Public Food Service. In other words, he's saying we've got mega companies in place that do our work for us. Abolishing freely competing small food companies, these giants of indigestion artificially create consumers' tastes and demands, which may not be in the interest of your health. So you are desiring things, and you don't know why you are desiring them. And he's going to tell you later that you're not going to escape it. The only way to escape it is for you all to join together in a community and start raising your own food and trading food among yourselves. 
In an interview with Griffin in 1985, the same man says, the same defector who understands communist propaganda says, ideological subversion is the process to change the perception of reality of every American. That despite the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions. I can preach and preach and preach and preach and preach and preach and preach. It's always baffled me. It's always baffled me. But now I'm understanding. I'm understanding. Despite the abundance of information, no one is able to come to a sensible conclusion. It's a great brainwashing process which goes very slow. Your leftists in the United States, all these professors, they are instrumental in the process of the subversion only to destabilize a nation. When their job is completed, they are not needed anymore. He basically says they'll be shot. Most of the people, so all these liberals, they think they're going to be part of the party, see. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be part of the party. No, the party's going to look at them as idiots. You know, you, you use this. You, you, you helped us bring this to power. Most of the people who underwent this in the 60s are now in positions of power. You cannot change their mind. They are programmed to respond to stimuli in a certain way. It is irreversible. These people cannot respond to facts. They only react in the way that they were programmed to. And, and, and don't, don't be so quick to dismiss this. I've given you things that hinder wisdom, and we talked about that. The Bible speaks of getting locked in a way of thinking to where information no longer can affect you. See, the demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Well, he said that in the 80s. This is scary. Exposure to true information does not matter anymore. You say, well, why are they letting all this information out? Why, why, why are they letting all of this out? We got the internet. We can find all of it. They don't care anymore because you're not going to stop. The people have already been programmed. They're not going to stop eating that junk. It, it, it's not going to stop. It is irreversible. These people cannot respond to facts. They, all, they only react in the way that they were programmed to. Uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. The next stage now, after demoralization, is destabilization. This time, the subverter does not care about your ideas, whether you eat junk food and get fat and flabby, doesn't matter anymore. What are they saying? They say once we reach the second stage, we don't care anymore. We've got enough control over America that feeding them a bunch of junk food and making them sick, it doesn't matter. They're going to keep doing what we programmed them to do, and none of that matters for the second stage. And then finally, what's after the second stage? After destabilization. Boy, things are certainly unstable right now, aren't they? Wow, they're just turbulent, unstable. He said the final stage is crisis, crisis crisis. The United States is in a state of war, undeclared total war against the basic principles and the foundations of this system. Unlike myself, you will have nowhere to defect to unless you want to live in Antarctica. What's he saying? Boy, it seems like things are almost at a crisis stage. You've got thousands and thousands and thousands of school children marching out here. Get rid of guns, get rid of guns, get rid of guns. Who's controlling them? Who made them that foolish? It was just a few weeks ago, it seems, that they were out in the streets, thousands and thousands of them saying, cops with guns are bad. Black lives matter. These cops are abusing their guns. So you want to get rid of guns. You want to get rid of guns. What about all the bad guys? They say, well, the police will take care of it. Well, you were just protesting the police having guns. You said you can't trust the police with guns just a few months ago. It's not about logic, folks. It's not about making sense. See? Wow. So according to these communist experts, putting America on junk food and hurting your body was their agenda. 
Can you read between the lines in Bloomberg just the other day? The population bomb has been diffused. What? To save both the environment and themselves, humans must have fewer kids. Fortunately, this is happening. The shift from agriculture to urban life means less incentive for families to have kids to work on farm. Basically, the writer in Bloomberg magazine says it's working. It's working. Our dream is coming to pass. And he said, no, no, don't even worry about the Muslims. They're not having children either. He basically went around and said, and the families that are having children are not having many of them anymore. He says, because we've got you living in cities, we've got you afraid of farm life, and we've got the women filled with feminism, so they don't want to have children. It's working. They're bragging. They're saying it's working. It's working. I'll close with natural news. He wrote this back in 2014. After having now analyzed, I think, after having now analyzed over 1,000 foods, superfoods, vitamins, junk foods, and popular bever beverages for heavy metals and other substances at the Natural F News Forensic Food Labs, I have arrived at a conclusion so alarming and urgent that it can only be stated bluntly. Based upon what I'm seeing, the food supply appears to be intentionally designed to end human life rather than nourish it. My lab has uncovered scientific proof that substances are intentionally formulated into dietary products to, derive, to drive consumers mentally insane while causing widespread infertility, organ damage, and a loss of any ability to engage in rational, conscious thinking. This goes far beyond the mere contamination of foods with heavy metals, a subject which is grave all by itself. Rather, this is about the intentional formulation of toxic substances into products consumed by the masses on a regular basis. The result is what you see unfolding around you right now, mass insanity. The effects of this are devastating to human civilization. The collapse of a capable workforce, the rise of the masses dependent on government for survival, food has become a weapon against humanity. World War III appears to already be underway and it is being waged as a stealth war via the food supply. Toxic ingredients like sodium nitrate, aspartame, are formulated to work at subacute levels so they don't cause people to drop dead right away. Instead, they cause the chronic, long-term, degenerative collapse of body and mind. Go read about polio. They say vaccines got rid of polio. Go ask them if you could catch polio from somebody. Go ask them if somebody has polio, could I catch polio from them? No, they found out that polio is from the pesticides and food supply and other things that were happening at that time, but they don't want you to know that, see. So they just changed the name. People are still getting polio. They just changed the name of it, you know. Um, These are, there are tremendous profits to be made, you see, from first poisoning the masses and then treating them for the side effects of that poisoning until they send you to hospice and kill you. A modern young man growing up today in America and living on processed foods is little more than a shadow of the strong, vibrant young man who worked in the farms just three generations ago. Today's generation of youth is pathetic, weak, academically inept, and heavily pampered with their video game consoles. Ritalin drugs and air-conditioned schools with a watered-down curriculum. They've been dumbed down, stripped of nutrients, medicated to the point where literal zombies now walk among us. In fact, the people all around you are over-medicated, overfed, and at the same time, wildly malnourished. Their brains and bodies are heavily contaminated with destructive chemicals, heavy metals, and synthetic materials. Go ahead, scream. Go ahead, run. Put your head under the pillow. It's not going to change the fact that somebody wants to kill you. In a very real sense, the daily consumption of processed food has become a ritual of slow suicide, mindlessly repeated everywhere that factory foods have invaded once same, sane societies. And ever learning, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You say, I just don't believe people will be involved in a conspiracy. Do you believe in a media conspiracy? Do you believe that, that the media is only owned by a few major companies and that they have an agenda? Do you believe that? Well, why wouldn't the food companies have an agenda? They've already been busted in the past. Read about how the food companies conspired to make you think white sugar was okay and to demonize butter, which your body needed.
Go read about how they did that to people in the 60s and 70s. Go read about Harvard University Dr. Frederick Stair, founder of the first head of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard University School of Public Health. When I first got saved, I started reading newspapers, and I read Stair in the 70s. I went back and looked at these things, and he was saying, oh, Coca-Cola is good for you. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what, what is he saying in the 70s? Who is this man that is against organic eating and wants you to be on pesticides? Why, does he, why is this Harvard doctor telling people this? Every single day, or at least every week in the paper, he wrote an article praising junk food. Don't you believe what they're telling you? Don't believe what they're telling you. Then they found out that he was receiving millions of dollars, millions of dollars from Coca-Cola, General Foods, and the National Soft Drink Association. You're telling me there's not conspiracy? Nourishing Tradition says, Dr. Frederick Stair's articles in weekly newspaper columns began assuring the public that there was nothing wrong with white bread, sugar, and highly processed foods. He recommended one cup of corn oil per day to prevent heart disease. And in one article, he suggested Coca-Cola as a daily snack. <coughs> if you don't get born again... I don't care how healthy you get. You're going to hell in the lake of fire for all eternity. And the devil wants you to go to hell. He wants you to go to the lake of fire. But if you're saved, bought by the blood of Jesus, trusting the blood of Jesus, the devil has one goal, to keep you from the coming kingdom. And he will do everything he can to cause you to sin in your body. And if he, if he can begin by making you intemperate in regard to food, he hopes he can then work up to make you intemperate in regard to other things. And whether he ever gets you in sin or adultery or divorce or some other things, if he kills you, makes you sick before your time, keeps you from going to church, you get 52 weeks, to go to ch 52 weeks out of a year to go to church, if he could just cut that in half, He's happy. Make you too tired, too sick to get out and do anything for the Lord. Dear Holy Father, we do pray that we'll recognize how the devil works. We do pray that somehow, God, even though they've used propaganda to blind people's minds, I do pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that your Holy Spirit that can break open every stronghold, that God, right now, your Holy Spirit can smash in pieces the devil's strongholds and I now pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you break them, you smash them to bits, God, and that, Father, somehow or another, you open up people's minds, Lord. I know the new generation, Father, uh, is more open to want to eat right. Lord, I remember telling my grandmother at eight years old, something's wrong with these hot dogs. And she said, I've been eating these hot dogs all my life. Nothing's wrong with them. I know how it's hard, Father, to get those that are already accustomed to things, to change. And... But Father, I do pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that not only you awaken many young people to throw off these shackles and to be aware of what the devil's trying to do to cross-dress their minds and bodies and to hinder them and make them sickly and weak. But I pray many middle-aged people Many elderly people, Lord, will right now say, you know, however many more days I have left, how many more months, I'm going to take care of myself. As Paul asked for his coat when he was in prison, about to get his head cut off. Dear Holy Father, I do pray you move upon him. You move upon him to be healthy. And Father, let that just be a foundation, a beginning. Because you want us healthy in body, soul, and spirit. Oh, help us, God. And I do pray, Father, that many will find abundant life, abundant health, and they will use that to read the Bible more, go soul winning more, go to church more, to think better, 
to pray more. In Jesus' holy name, amen.